Good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, God is so um, good to all of us. And I just uh, like to thank him for allowing me to be here another year. In fact, it's my uh, birthday today. And uh, he's blessed me for a numerous amount of years. Um, I even went to work today and I'm here this evening still going uh, strong uh, because he gives me my strength as it says uh, he strengthens us and he is with us amen and uh, he is the hand that I am and amen. the scripture says uh, if you go to John the 16th chapter <clears throat> And then I'm going to pray. Go to John, the 16th chapter. The 32nd verse. I think this is what we forget so many times. 1632 says, Take careful notice, and the hour is coming. And has arrived when you will all be scattered to each his own home. And he was telling them, leaving me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. In the world you have tribulation, distress, and suffering. But be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. He still wants to have joy no matter what's going on with the virus and the floods and the hurricanes and the tornadoes. Be filled with joy. I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory abiding. And see, if we with Jesus, he's with us, and then we with God. And God is almighty, he's all powerful, and he's everyone, everywhere, and he protects us. This is what we have to understand. He protects those who love him and who belong to him. That's who he protects. And John the uh, 30th, uh, if you go to John the 3rd chapter, We just see here in the third chapter, starting at the 15th verse, it says, So whoever believes will in him have eternal life after physical death and actually live forever. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he, he even gave his one and only begotten son. So that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. And it all goes back to believing. Amen. Without a doubt. Believing. It says, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge and condemn the world. That is, to initiate the final judgment of the world but that the world might be saved through him. He already know the condition of this world that we're in right now. It's full of a lot of uh, wicked people. Uh, they're deceitful. They, they kill people. They're just doing everything. But he has a remnant here that belongs to him, that belongs to Christ. And we're still getting the word out to the people. It's not just us. It's many people that God has, that has trust and belief in and that's why the world is still going on now. If it wasn't to be just like Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham asked if, if it's 50 there, are you going to destroy it? He said no. If it's 40. Mm -hmm. it went all the way down to 10. It wasn't even 10 righteous people there. And so it got destroyed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God knows that it's just not time yet. You may be looking at it and say, with well, all this going on, I know God is coming. You don't know when he's coming because it's never been written. They asked Jesus. He said, I do not know. Amen. And, but we have time. It says in the scripture, God is extraordinarily patient with us. 
given us a chance to do better because he don't want anybody to perish. That uh, hell was made for the fallen angels and Satan. But Satan is doing his best uh, to take as many of God's people that God created with him. And those people who belong to God are the people who love God. The ones who are obedient to God. The ones who walk in with God and following God. See, we following him because we know we can't get in front of him. Amen. Now, he's a leader. He is leading us. And 18 says, whoever believes and has decided to trust in him as personal Savior and Lord is not judged. You don't want to be judged. It's not judged. No rejection, no condemnation, condemnation. But the one who does not believe has decided to reject him as paper, personal Savior and Lord. It's already judged already. That one has been convicted and sentenced because he has not believed and trusted in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God, the one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, the only one who alone can save him. Amen. And it says, this is the judgment that is the cause for an indictment, the test by which people are judged, the basis for the sentence, light has come into the world, talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And people love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. But every wrongdoer hates the light. You know, the, the wrongdoer hate to see you right, hate to see you stand up and believe and trust in God. The wrongdoer hate to see the love that you have for others. The ones that may not even love you back, they think we're crazy and foolish. But uh, we're not worried about them because God sees everything. He sees your heart and says, for every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light but shrinks from it for the fear that his sinful, worthless activities will be exposed and condemned it says, but whoever practices truth and does what is right, that's being obedient to God and doing the things he tells us to do, to love one another and seek the best for one another. That's doing right, morally, ethical, and spiritually. Comes to the light so that his works may be plainly shown to what they are, accomplishing God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, and dependence on him. I, I hope you heard that dependence on him because we can't do nothing but fail without God. We, we're dependent on him. We're dependent on him to come here on the days that we come here that we are still have a room uh, and be able to get the word out to you. We can't depend on man. Anything can happen to this building or any of the equipment or things we have here. We're dependent on God. Anything can happen to us. Amen. But we know God has given us strength. We know he has mercy on us. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect. There's many things that I need to change in my life that the Holy Spirit show me all the time. Through the night, through the day, the Spirit of God is talking to me, telling me how I need to do better so I can... Uh, people are observing and what we do when God tells us to do something. That's how the uh, manifestations come about. We had to do exactly what he tells us to do and say what he tells us to say, just like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if you just go with me for a minute here to uh, Numbers, the book of Numbers, the 20th chapter. We had to do exactly what he tells us to do. So don't think you can be so high and mighty in a church or you can be a priest or, you know, a pope or anything, a president or whatever. But we all had to answer to the Lord. Uh, even though he used Moses to uh, go to uh, Egypt and talk to Pharaoh and tell him what to tell Pharaoh to let the people go. Amen. 
we got we to gotta follow the Lord with whatever he tell us to do. And as here, uh, we had read the other day how, how uh, Aaron's sons had uh, burned a strange incense to God, and they were already taught and trained uh, what, to, what to do when they went into the, uh, before the altar. But they wanted to, they did what they wanted to do, and God burned them up. And it says here, we started the, uh, the eighth verse. Many times you would hear about uh, where God is saying how people, the people murmured against him uh, in this place of uh, Meribah. It says in the eighth verse, the 20th chapter, take the rod and you and your brother Aaron talking to Moses, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock in front of them because they, the people were murmuring and they was uh, very upset uh, with Moses. And uh, the third verse said, the people contended with Moses and said, if only we had perished when our brothers perished in the plague before the Lord. Why have you bought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness to die here? We and our lives stuck. Why have you made us to come up from Egypt, complaining about the after date of freedom from slavery, uh, to this wretched place? It has not a place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. And then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent other meeting, the tabernacle, and fell on their faces before the Lord in prayer. And then the glory and the brilliance of the Lord appeared, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I'm going to stop here, and then I'm going to go back. I'm going to be right there. I'm just going to open up in the word of prayer. I got a little excited. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask you to lead me and uh, lead my tongue and my mind and my heart everything I have that you've given me. And Lord, I accept. Uh, I accept you into my heart and my mind. Because I, Lord, I know my thoughts are far away as the dew on the ground as yours is in heaven. And Lord, you made me and you fixed me uh, to do the things you would have me to do and say. And Lord, I ask you to bless everyone here, those that are listening. Lord, fix their ears so they can hear. Uh, Lord, creating all of us a clean heart so we can receive you in our heart and receive your word into our heart because your word cleanses us. It purifies us, makes us holy, Lord. And we thank you for everything that you've given us in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It says in the 8th verse, Take the rod and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock. He told them to talk to the rock mm. in front of them so that it will pour out its water. And this way you shall bring water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and the livestock drink fresh water. So Moses took the rod from the before the Lord, just as he had commanded. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. Moses said to them, listen now, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his hand in anger. And with his rod, he struck the rock twice. Not just one time, but twice. Instead of speaking to the rock, as the Lord had commanded. See, we got to do what he tell us to do. But he, he got anger in his heart. It was in his heart. It took over the love that God had put in the heart. And this is what gets us into trouble. God has filled our heart with everything that needs to be there. 
and we be putting other things in it. Praise God. I got convicted last night looking at a show on TV. And uh, I be giggling and laughing, but I, I know it's not a, a righteous program. My husband said, I don't know why we even looking at this. And the Holy Spirit said to me at the same time, I don't know why you're looking at it when I told you not to look at it. Hmm. So I can't look at it no more. But uh, we got to do what the God tell us to do. Amen. So he, he struck the, because it, it be going in your heart, polluting your mind. When we be looking at things and hearing things that's not of God, we need to have the word in us to clean us up. And uh, so instead of speaking to the rock, uh, as the Lord had commanded, and the water poured out abundantly, the congregation of our livestock drank the fresh water. But the Lord said to Moses, see, he be just looking. Lord, Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. He be looking at us. Looking at me and all of, all of y'all out there. And the, uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed, <laughs> trusted me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, you therefore shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. Mm. And these are the waters of Meribah, contention and strife for the sons of Israel contended, contended with God, you know, arguing and fussing and murmuring with the Lord. And he showed himself holy among them. So none of them went. Amen, that's true. I mean, we got to watch uh, what we say and what we do with our hands and everything. So uh, it's a lot of things going on today. A lot of uh, tribulation going on today. A lot of, uh, what does it say, suffering going on today. A lot of distress going on today. But if you with God, be a good carriage. Be confident and undaunted. Be filled with joy. Keep your belief and trust in God. And you, you're going to make it. But you can't make it by yourself like he, what he has said when I read before. Because he knows that we depend on him. Moses and Aaron forget, just like the people did that we depend on him and that he's holy. So when you depend on somebody, you depend on God's help. We got to do what he tell us to do. I mean, to, to, the, to the exact, to the letter. I mean, he is God. He is holy. And he loves us. He has given us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, as I read in the, in the third chapter of John. And he didn't, he didn't, uh, have Jesus come to condemn us. He came, had him come so we can have everlasting life, eternal life with him. And that's the only way, that's the only way you're going to uh, receive, receive eternal life. If you go to John the 14th chapter, the sixth verse Oh, I, I closed it more. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. So no one comes to the Father but through me. So we got to uh, go through the uh, Jesus Christ in order to, to get to God and to receive eternal life. You're not going to have eternal life. And then I'm going to... Uh, we're going to keep going because this is a, a good lesson. Uh, turn to Job, the 11th chapter. And this is not a ride where you can get worn <coughs> off when you feel like it. You strap yourself in. It's 
strap yourself around the word of God. Hold on to it, his word. Because he is the word. That's what it says in John the first chapter. It's not my word. He says in John the first chapter, in the beginning before all time was the word Christ, and the word was with God, and the word was God himself, and he was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. All things were made and came into existence through him and without him. Not even one thing was made that has come into being. In him is life and the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men. See, God gives us life. And we got to hold on to him. It says, the light shines on in darkness, and the darkness did not understand it, or overpower it, or appropriate it, or absorb it, and was unreceptive to it. Unreceptive to the light. And it says, he, the 11th verse says, uh, um, well, I might as well read through it. It says, there came a, a man commissioned sent from God, whose name was John, John the Baptist. And this man came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe, that's that word again, believe in Christ, the light through him. So John was preaching repentance, telling us that we need to repent from our sins and letting us know that uh, Jesus was coming. And it says, John was not the light, but came to testify about the light of Christ. It says, there is, there it was, the true light, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. He is, he, Christ, was in the world. And through the world was made through him, though it was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, that which belonged to him, he, his world, his creation, his possession, and those who were his own people, the Jewish nation, did not receive it and welcome him. But as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God, that is, to those who believe, the word again, believe, and you can say you believe all you want to, but if you don't adhere and trust and rely on his name and depend on him, then you, you, you're just not with him. God knows if we trust and depend on him because we do what he tells us to do. We do exactly what he tells us to do because we know we can't do anything but fail without him. And that's not showing that you're weak. That's showing that you're strong and that you have true belief and love for the Father. And it says, who were born not of blood, natural conception, nor of the will of the flesh, physical impulse, nor of the will of man, that is a natural father, but of God, that is a divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed and renewed and sanctified. Your spirit is born again. You still have the same body, but your spirit is new. It's uh, been transformed. And it says, in the word, Christ became flesh and lived among us, and we actually saw his glory. The glory is, belongs to the one and only begotten Son of God, the Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind who is full of grace, truth, absolutely free of deception. God cannot lie. And he is not going to trick you or test you. He doesn't do that. You may say that because you didn't, uh, fell out here on your face and got in some trouble. Mm. Talking about God testing me. No, you were just plain old disobedient. Mm. 
And I'm not trying to talk about nobody. I've been there in the same shape myself. Yeah. And all I could do was uh, dust myself off and wipe my tears from my eyes and say, Lord, thank you for uh, not killing me. Uh, thank you for having mercy on me because I'm still here. And you still give me an opportunity to do better because he will, because he loved you. As I said, he didn't come here to condemn you. And it says, and John testified repeatedly about him and cried out, testifying officially for the record with fidelity and reverence. This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has higher rank than I and has priority over me. He existed before me. For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth. We have received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. This is what you receive when you accept Christ. So no, you, you, don't, you won't uh, have to want for anything. You won't have to thirst for anything. You won't have to hunger for anything. Because he is taking care of you. If you do what he tells you to do. He's not going to tell you anything wrong to do. The Holy Spirit is not going to tell you anything wrong to do. You will have abundance, prosperity, and, and your good health. Because he's not going to tell you to do anything to hurt yourself. He's not going to tell you anything to kill yourself. Those things are of Satan. Satan is here to steal, kill, and destroy. And when God tells you to do something, if it is not in any of those categories, killing and stealing and destroying, then you do that because it's of good. But if you're talking about this God and told you to do that, then you're just lying. Amen. You're just lying. But as I said in Numbers, you, no matter how much you've been walking with the Lord, like Moses was walking with the Lord, he was talking with the Lord. And just that quick, anger got in his heart and he snapped and did what he wanted to do. And he had done that 40, many years before then when he uh, had killed that Egyptian when he got angry. See, it's good to know what you are. It's good to know that you are not perfect. Because uh, when you know, Lord have mercy. When you know you're not perfect and you're capable of doing anything, then it makes you very careful, very careful. But when you think you're above everything, like the scriptures say, when you think more high of yourself than what you are. See, when you're a humble person, you, you, you're going slow because the race isn't given to the to the, the one who's going to be so fast, the race is given to those who are steadfast, unmovable, abounding into the word of God. You know, you just stand steady with it. But the, uh, the urban person or the person who don't want to listen and think they know everything, they quick to go off. But the one who's humble and meek, we waiting. And somebody may say, what you you still there, why don't you did this or did that? And you be sitting on and waiting to hear from the Lord. And they say, wait to hear from the Lord. You better come on with us. You know, because we got it going on over here. We got all kind of stuff happening every day through the night, through the week. And you still sitting there? No, you better wait. Wait on the Lord. Amen. And so, um, as I'm saying, God is good to us. And then go to Job, like I said, the 11th chapter. I'm going to try, I'm going to be talking about the heart now because we see how the heart can get you in trouble. If you have God in your heart and you want to follow Jesus Christ and you got full of love, then you're going to do just that. You're not going to be um, distracted as easy because you, you you love him so much. You're trying your best, and he know it. He'll help you. He gave us the Holy Spirit to help, 
help us. Uh, the 11th chapter. It says, I'm just going to read the 13th verse right here. It says, if you direct your heart on the right path and stretch out your hands to him. You know, we got to stretch out our hands to him. If sin is in your hand, put it far away from you. And do not let wrongdoing dwell in your tents. And you know, our, our tent, that's where we be living in. You know, so we got to be careful. Boy, did I get a good lecture last night. Just by my husband saying two words and it just went all through me. He didn't know it, but uh, I said, mm, mm, mm. Got it dwelling in the tent and everything. You know, it, it affects your mind, whatever you um, have in your hand or in your heart. And you don't think that it will, but it, it can cause you to uh, stray away from the Lord. And that's what we, we don't want to do that. We don't want to stray away from, from God. And then go to um, Isaiah, the 32nd chapter. So we got to watch, you know, what we have in our hand and in our heart. If you know it's not right and it's not a God, then you got to leave it alone. Even if it seems funny and uh, make you giggle or something like that. In fact, instead of uh, going there, children, go to Hebrews, the third chapter. I was looking at something that's getting into my, um, getting into my Sunday lesson. Sorry about that, y'all. God loves you. He loves me, too. And, uh, third chapter and it says here this is very important here. it says therefore just as the Holy Spirit says today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts talking about the heart again as your fathers did the reason I had to read that so you know what I was talking about you know in numbers it says, do not harden your hearts as your fathers did in the rebellion of Israel at Meribah. And I just read about Meribah, you know, about how they was uh, contending with the Lord, you know, and, and fussing about why did he bring them out of Egypt into this land with no water and they was complaining about food and everything. It says, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing my forbearance and tolerance and saw my works for 40 years and found I stood their test because I just keep reading therefore I was angered with the generation and said they always go astray in their heart because they turned their back on God. They strayed away in their heart. And they did not know my ways, nor become progressively better and more intimately acquainted with them. So I swore an oath in my way. They shall not enter my rest, the promised land. And that's what happened. They had, uh, Instead of coming closer to God, mm -hmm. that's what he want us to do, be closer to him. But instead of that, they want to stray in their heart. They start loving other things, other gods. And they even made themselves a, a golden calf. And uh, before long, they, want, they even wanted a king. And here God was their, their Lord and Savior, holy. He, was, he is God Almighty, and he had already told me, don't put no one before me. Love me with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with everything. 
And before long, they, they wanted a king that wasn't satisfied with God feeding them and bringing the rain down to let the crops grow. They, um, they had to go make an image. And he said, don't make no idols and worship idols. But they were doing all of this when he, when he was talking about this. That they went astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways. You right. know, become progressively better. Isn't it? That's going on now on the earth. They didn't become progressively better and more intimately acquainted with them. So I swore an oath in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. The promise. So, um, and then it says here, take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be any one of you a wicked, a wicked, unbelieving heart, which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord. A heart that turns away from the living God. God wants us to trust him and believe in him and rely on him. And see, we be relying on other things and other resources, other people when things come in our life. And those things and those people get you in trouble. Because they don't know the Lord and they don't love the God. They're not intimate with the Lord. And you can tell by the way they act. But it says here, but continue to encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today. And there is an opportunity so that none of you will be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin. Is cleverness and the loose of glamour. I mean, we got all kind of glamour going on today. And sophistication. Well, we believers have become partakers of Christ, sharing in all that the Messiah has for us. If only we hold firm our new confidence, which originally led us to him until the end. Whatever brought you to Christ, hold on to it. Well, it is said today, while there is still opportunity, if you hear his voice, mm -hmm. do not harden your heart as when they provoke me in the rebellion in the desert at Meribah. This is what God is telling us today. It says, for who were they? who heard and yet provoked him with rebellious acts. Was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Because they were doing everything all those 40 years. And he had been feeding them, clothing them. Their shoes hadn't wore out. Nobody was sick. He, he provided everything for them. And it says, was it not with those who sinned, whose dead bodies were scattered in the desert? And to whom did he swear an oath that they would not enter his rest? But to those who disobeyed, those who would not listen to his word. Mm. Now children, we doing what God tells us to do by bringing the word to you. We study, and God helps us uh, through the week, uh, and we're going to get better uh, and better. That's what the words say. When you get acquainted with them and close to them, hallelujah, <laughs> you get better Amen. and better. So I'm, I got to make sure my tent is cleaned out. And so are you. That's the word today. This is today. <laughs> While well, there is a still opportunity to hear. It says, so we see that 
they were not able to enter into his rest, the promised land, because of unbelief and unwillingness to trust in God. So when you read in your word, trust the word. You want action in your life to get better, your children to get better, your husband to get better, you know, trust in the Lord. And uh, do what he tell you to do. You may not like what he tell you to do, but you better do it. You have a choice to keep doing as the world tells you to do, or you can do as God tells you to do. Now, some of you out there uh, know what I'm talking about. And uh, as you go on uh, in this lesson, go to Exodus, the 17th chapter. We got to do what he tells us to do. Amen. It's not my word. It is his word. And I don't have to worry about if you like me or not. Because he said that uh, those who don't like me don't like him. So, I mean, you're going against him. But if you love me, then you love him. And, uh, you know, the Lord don't let people just... Walk on his church and uh, uh, just do them any kind of way. And um, uh, it's a story here, and my husband was going over the other day, and we couldn't put our finger on it. For some reason, the Lord let me put my finger on it this morning because I guess he wants you to know about it. It says here on the 17th chapter about these Amalek people. Uh, and the reason God wanted to get them well, I'll just read the story. It says here in the 8th verse, The Amalek and his people came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And this they came at them right when they came out of Egypt. No, they were in a weak uh, condition. They thought. You know, when God is with you, you're not weak. We depend on him. That's what you got to, no matter how weak you feel or sick you feel, just say, Lord, I'm dependent on you. And then then act like it and be dependent on him. Don't, don't say you depended on him and then you start snatching and grabbing and everything else. That shows that you don't trust him and you're not honoring him at all. You better do what he tells you to do. What he tells you to say. Just just that and nothing else. Don't be like Moses and have a stick beating on something. Beating your children, beating your husband, because they won't do what you say, or your wife. Just speak to him with love, like he done told you to. And you just going to snap, you end up in jail. Maybe dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says, And the Amalek and his people came and fought with Israel at Refit them. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out and fight against the Amalek and his people tomorrow. And I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of uh, God in my hand. See, he had already uh, told him that. And so Joshua did as Moses said and fought with the Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hare went up on the hilltop. Now, when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he lowered his hand, due to fatigue, Amalek prevailed. He got stronger, you know, when his hand was down. Mm -hmm. uh, but Moses' hands were heavy and he grew tired. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And then Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. So it was that his hands were steady under the sunset. Mm. So Joshua overwhelmed and, and defeated the Amalek and his people with the edge of a sword. And it, it says here, then the Lord said to Moses, write this in the book as a memorial and a recited to Joshua. He wanted to recite it to him. 
that I will utterly wipe out the memory of the Amalek and his people from under the heaven. And that's why he wanted them wiped out, because it did come up later. You know, because they didn't ever did they didn't get them all. And then uh, Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner, saying, The Lord has sworn an oath. The Lord has will have war against the people of Amalek from generation to generation. And um mm. Got another little spot here. Y'all just hold on tight. I'm pretty sure those were the same people that uh, came up against Saul. They were. And, uh, <coughs> and you need to know this because it just don't pay to be disobedient to the Lord. It doesn't pay uh, to do, you know, to be doing things when God tell you not to do it. Because he had wanted um, Saul to wipe them out also, but uh, Saul took it on himself to save some of those people, to save the king. And uh, he ended up having the spirit of, of the Lord taken from him because of his disobedience. Because of the uh, way he wanted to act. We'll, we'll get into that another time. But anyway, it, it pays to do what he tells us to do. Uh, and I've read numbers already. And let's go to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. And see, it's not so, it is important for us to obey God. God but the, what we recognize is how holy God is and that he is our, he is, all we have. He, he holds this earth together. He's created the heavens and the earth. And then we have the nerve to um, not do what he tells us to do. And that's a lot of nerve. And the 16th verse in the 6th chapter says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at uh, Massa. See, we're not supposed to be, uh, actually, we call ourselves, uh, that is testing God when we be disobedient to him and not do what he tells us to do. It says in the 17th verse, you shall diligently keep foremost in your thoughts and actively do the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes as he has commanded us. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord so that it may be well with you and that you may go in and possess the land which the Lord has sworn to give you and your father, so um, we had to do what he tell us to do because he, he protects us and he loves us. And it says in the 13th verse, you shall fear only the Lord, your God. That's the only one we're supposed to fear. And we get in trouble fearing people. It says that you shall fear only the Lord, your God, and you shall serve him with our filled reverence. That's what holiness and profound respect and swear oaths by his name alone. And then getting back into what I said already in the uh, fifth verse, in the sixth chapter, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all in your mind and with all your soul, with all your strength, your entire being. So we got to stay focused. When you feel yourself slipping away, and you do know when you're slipping away because the Holy Spirit be telling each and every one of us, including myself. 
Uh, but as my husband had went over class with us on Saturday, a lot of times we don't want to move out of our comfort zone. And so we don't want to uh, do some things God wants us to do because we, uh, we out of our comfort zone. We may have to confront uh, some people or some things in our life that we don't want to be bothered with at that time. But we got to do what God tells us to do regardless. And we can't shrink away from believing and having faith in God. Is my time up. Okay, I'll continue on Sunday with this, um, with whatever God wants me to say, not what I want to say. I thank everyone for listening. Remember this today. Don't harden your heart.